The following program is a presentation of Grace Communion International and Grace Communion Seminary and is made possible by generous donations from viewers like you. On this episode of You're Included, theologian Dr. Elmer Collier discusses how hell and God's wrath are related to God's love. Our host is Dr. J. Michael Fazell. Elmer, thanks for being with us. It's delightful to be with you it's again. It's a pleasure to have you. Uh, hell, we want to talk about hell today. Mm. A lot of churches will not even preach about it. You never yeah. hear anybody preaching about hell. Other churches, that's pretty much what they preach about every week. So why the divide? Mm. What does Trinitarian theology have to say about hell? How can we understand it in terms of the grace of God and the judgment of God? Now, there has to be something amusing about inviting a United Methodist to talk about hell. <laughs> uh, when I ask my seminary students uh, how many of them have heard sermons about hell in the United Methodist Church, virtually none of them have. Hell, in many circles, has become almost an unpreachable doctrine and therefore is not mentioned at all. And in other circles, as you mentioned, you know, hell becomes um, so prominent. The question is, why did hell become an unpreachable doctrine for some? And I think we have to go back in history and take a look at that. And I think part of it was because of the way hell was taught and preached in the church. Um, so if you go in, say, Reformed scholasticism, uh, particularly even in the Presbyterian Church in North America uh, in the 19th century, um, hell was related primarily to the wrath of God heaven to the love of God. Uh, God loves the elect, God hates the reprobate. So you have God's attribute of love related to heaven and those that are elect, God's wrath related to those in hell. And hell was portrayed um, in very, very uh, grotesque and graphic uh, terms. So it's not coincidental uh, that if you were going to be ordained a Presbyterian in the Presbyterian Church in America in the early part of the 19th century and you went before your presbytery and you were asked various questions, one of the questions you were asked is, are you willing to be damned for the glory of God? Because you see, if hell uh, is the place that manifests the wrath of God to God's glory, God's uh, numinous holiness and justice is manifest in hell, then you ought to be willing to be damned for the glory of God uh, so that that attribute of God uh, can in fact be seen, God's wrath and God's holiness. So, of course, the proper answer is, is yes. And there was a young uh, Presbyterian who was going to uh, be ordained and he was asked by his Presbytery if he was willing to be damned for the glory of God and he was a hyper-Calvinist and he said, yes, not only that, I'm willing for this entire Presbytery to be damned for the glory of God. So, um, you know, that was not the correct answer, of course. Also, in the hymnal at that time, um, there was a hymn that sang that part of the glory was heaven, was for the saints in heaven to watch sinners suffer in hell. And I think that kind of depiction of hell is what made the doctrine unpreachable. And it went something like this. People who knew something of the love of God in Christ revealed on the cross just sent something profoundly wrong with that kind of picture that God would so hate the reprobate that they would suffer for all eternity and that part of the glory of heaven would be to watch the reprobate suffer in hell, maybe even one's relatives and friends suffer there. There's something incommensurate with that, uh, with the picture of the love of God revealed in Christ. And so I think because of that, gradually um, hell uh, sort of, uh, at least in mainland Christianity in North America, slid off to the side and the emphasis became much more on the love of God. So I think in a lot of um, mainline circles, oftentimes uh, God is portrayed as a nice God and we're portrayed as nice people and we should get along in the church. And of course, that doesn't work very well either. So I think part of the reason that hell become, became unpreachable is because um, it was related only to the wrath of God. This is not tenable, Mike, as you know. Uh, God's attributes are not separate. You cannot divide God's holiness and God's love, uh, uh, God's mercy uh, and God's justice and wrath. God is ultimately simple. All of those attributes are integrated and so somehow we have to think about this in a different way, a way that unifies it, a way that, um, that brings uh, hell into relation to God's love and not simply uh, God's wrath. 
So how do we know that the wrath of God isn't the predominant thing and the love of God is secondary to that? Yeah. Well, this goes to how we, um, how we think about the attributes of God. And um, one of the problems, I think, both uh, simply in popular culture and in Christian circles, and even in some respects in the great tradition of the church, is there's been a tendency to focus first on the attributes of the one God and only afterwards talk about the Trinity, and oftentimes God's attributes are not related to the doctrine of the Trinity. You see this even in Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologia. Uh, the, first, uh, the second through the 26th question in the Summa deals with uh, attempts to prove God's existence, conversations about God's attributes, and then only afterwards does Aquinas engage in any kind of conversation about the doctrine of the Trinity, and that prior discussion of the one God and God's attributes is never really integrated with the doctrine of the Trinity. And so, um, you know, that's one, one way of approaching the attributes of God. If you look at the arguments, uh, often uh, they are sort of are developed on the basis of general revelation, and a natural theology. I think this happens a lot of time with laity and congregations. You know, they have some kind of concept of goodness and love, some kind of concept of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of knowledge, of uh, other attributes of God, and they posit their perfection and then attribute it, them to God. But of course, that doesn't work very well because actually when we look at, well, how actually do we know anything about God's attributes? Uh, I would say the place that we most preeminently know about God's attributes is in God's self-revelation to us in Jesus Christ, realized in our life by the Holy Spirit. So if we want to know what God's love and holiness is like, rather than start with human experience, posit its perfection and attribute it to God, or even do a concordance method where we look up everything that has to say about holiness or love or justice in the Bible about God, the appropriate way to do that is to look through Scripture and see what God has actually revealed in Jesus Christ. And there we find out that God's attributes turn out to be rather different uh, than what we might assume they were based on these other ways of thinking about it. I wonder how many Christians realize that there are two totally different views of God and a lot of times that they actually hold both at the same time. That's a very good observation, Mike, and it goes to the heart of this particular problem. And, and the real problem with it is when you have this kind of uh, view that God uh, hates those in hell and loves those in heaven, uh, the problem is, is you end up with what we call in theology a deus absconditus, a dark inscrutable deity that we really don't understand behind the back of what God has actually revealed in Jesus Christ. So um, what tends to happen then is the love of God uh, that you see in Christ gets only related to heaven, the wrath of God relates to those in hell, and, and that's simply not tenable. It's the same God. God's attributes finally cannot be div divided. And the fundamental problem with the doctrine of hell that made it unpreachable is that it was only related to the wrath of God and not to the love of God. And I think that a more helpful way to think about hell is to relate it to the love of God. We don't want to get rid of the wrath of God. I mean, it's an important aspect uh, of God, but it has to be united uh, in a seamless way with God's love. And this is what has oftentimes tended not to be the case, so that you have, again, basically two different doctrines of God, a God of love and a God of wrath, uh, and they're finally not reconciled. They just sort of sit there um, irreconciled, and we hope that the God of love is the one that relates to us. Uh, and of course, this is the, the problem that you find in, uh, in later Calvinism. The doctrine of double predestination was designed to emphasize the sovereignty of God to give the elect the assurance that they'd persevere so that they wouldn't have any kind of fear in this life. But the great irony is, is when you have a doctrine of God behind your doctrine of salvation where um, God's wrath and God's love are separate, you're always a little bit at, ill at ease wondering which God you're going to finally meet at the end. And so it's not coincidental that in later Calvinism, what immediately becomes the, the, the question? How do I know whether I'm among the elect or the reprobate? Well, when you look at Scripture, what does it say? You'll know the, true, the tree by its fruit. So the very thing that Calvinism was designed uh, and double predestination was designed to kick out of soteriology, any kind of fear that you wouldn't persevere and you wouldn't go to be, um, uh, you would go to hell and you wouldn't go to be with God, comes in in the back door practically and people have to somehow assure themselves that they're among the elect. And so they work really hard to produce fruit. And so the very kind of legalism and works righteousness comes back in at another level um, and is haunted uh, that later, um, later Calvinism. But the fundamental problem is you're right. 
It's this divergent doctrines of God, you know, a God of wrath on the one side, a God of love on the other. And fundamentally, when we talk about how we really know God, if we do it through Jesus Christ's life, death, and resurrection, what we see in the cross is that God's love and God's wrath are not finally separate. They're, they're, they're two aspects uh, of a single attribute uh, that is the fundamental character of God. Uh, the love of God in Christ is patently real on the cross, but we also see God's hatred for, um, toward sin. So it isn't that God loves the elect and hates the reprobate. Uh, God loves us all, but hates the sin in our life. And therefore, I think we have to relate um, hell to the love of God. So how does hell fit into that picture then? Well, uh, Mike, first of all, where do we finally see the holiness and wrath and judgment of God against sin finally um, find its proper place. It's on the cross. That's where the, the, the moment of darkness and judgment occurs. It's not coincidental that when you look in the book of Revelation in chapter 5 and it talks about the lion of the tribe of Judah who alone can open the scroll and initiate the final process of judgment, in the next verse, uh, John says, what does he see? He sees a lamb as if it was slain on the judgment throne. You see, there's no contradiction between the lion of the tribe of Judah and the lamb of God looking like it's slain as the one who's finally going to judge us because the final judgment isn't something different from what takes place on the cross. It's the revelation of what takes place on the cross and the final outworking of it. So it's there on the cross that we see the wrath of God uh, meted out against human sin and guilt and alienation but it's Christ, our older brother, our elder brother who's assumed our broken, diseased humanity, um, turned it back to God and taken it into judgment against sin and guilt. Christ is the one who bears the wrath and the judgment of God as the incarnate one, as the second person of the Trinity, not just an innocent man. So it's really within the relations between the persons of the Trinity there on the cross that God's wrath and justice and holiness against human sin is finally dealt, dealt with ultimately, um, in Christ our Lord. So this means that whatever punishment can take place in hell, it cannot be the same punishment that Christ has already endured for human sin and guilt and alienation uh, there on the cross. It can only bear witness to that fact. But the other side of it is that at the same time that the cross is the judgment of God, it's also the revelation of the love of God for sinners. So God loves the sinners that are in hell. And therefore, we have to relate hell not only to the judgment that takes place on the cross, but also the love of God that takes place on the cross. What if, Mike, hell is a better place for sinners who in the end, in their folly, reject the love of God in Christ than heaven? Whenever in Scripture we see a sinner, apart from the mediation of Christ, in the presence of the high and holy God before whom the angels veil their faces, they're always like Isaiah in chapter six. Woe is me for I am undone. I've seen the Lord on his throne. I am, an un, I am a, a man of unclean lips. I live a, among a people of unclean lips. What if hell isn't simply a place of punishment? What if it's a place of refuge where the sinner is shielded from the unmediated presence of God because they finally turned away from Christ. Listen to the words of Ultimate the Infidel on his deathbed. My principles have poisoned my friends. My extravagance has beggared my son. My unkindness has murdered my wife. And is there a hell? O oh, most holy yet gracious and loving God, hell is a refuge if it hide me from your frown. So we relate hell to the love of God and it becomes not simply a place of punishment but a place of refuge for the sinner where the sinner and his or her uh, unrepentance and sin-sick folly is shielded from the very presence of God because they would be more unhappy and uncomfortable in heaven than they would be there in hell. So it sounds like the, the fundamental issue that keeps a person from being able to understand grace, hell, judgment, mercy, and so on together in a, in a healthy theological way, a biblical way, is the, is, is the idea that most have of when they think of God, they think of God as a single, solitary mm. individual 
in heaven, uh, some kind of a fatherly figure, whatever it is mm -hmm. they have in their mind, it's yeah. flowing beard or whatever, but one, one individual, one God, yeah who does all this, who has hell and he has grace and mercy, and they, the, most do not typically think of God as a trinity, mm -hmm. as Father, Son, and Spirit in relation uh, eternally. Yes. And so if you don't think of God that way, mm -hmm. you're going to have these problems understanding the relationship between hell and heaven mm -hmm. and so on that you wouldn't have yes. if you had the, uh, the the thought of God in a triune way. Yes. Yeah, that's very true. And it's part of the problem, particularly in North American culture with our individualism. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the doctrine of the one God and the attributes of the one God um, have played a par far more pivotal role in virtually all forms of Christian faith. And, and then this idea of the, of the single one God, as you were saying before, mm -hmm. we construct ourselves. Yes by sitting down and saying, okay, what is, what would he be like? Yes. Well, he has to be perfect in love. Yes. And what other thing? He has to yep. be perfect in power. Yes. And he must absolutely yep. know everything. Yes. So he must be omniscient. Yeah. He must be omnipresent. He yes. has to be everywhere. So whatever superlative thing we can think of, yes. we attribute that to God and then we construct that. Yes. Raise it up and then think that is God. Yes. And how is he going to deal with hell and heaven and so on? Instead of yes. uh, the scriptural revelation yes. of Father, Son, and Spirit, and it totally messes up everything. Yeah, you're, no, you're exactly right. And this is why it's not coincidental that the whole theodicy question of how can be God, how can God be all good and all powerful and yet there be evil? While this exactly. is why this has been such a question for North American Christians. We create the problem ourselves by the way we construct our doctrine of God. You see, we think we know what God's power is like. We think we know what God's goodness is like, and we think we know what evil is like. And so we start out with presuppositions, uh, you know, based on our human experience. We direct those to the one God, and then we create this problem for ourselves. When we actually look about what God has revealed about God's power, God's goodness, and the problem of evil on the cross, we find out that we really don't understand any one of those. We really don't understand any one of those. And what's fundamentally important in this is how do we think about God and God's attributes? And here I think we have to go back to the biblical witness and look at what God has actually revealed. A prime example of this is the depiction of Jesus coming back at the end of time, you know, to, in final judgment. There's that wonderful uh, bumper sticker, you know, Jesus is coming back and boy is he, I won't even say it, ticked. You know, that kind of picture of Jesus coming back as a conquering warrior, you know, going to, you know, send the evil uh, to hell and the righteous uh, going to rapture them or carry them into heaven at some point. Isn't, that, isn't this what, so <clears throat> most of American Christians Many do. Uh, are looking forward to that with great, and that's, that's their whole worldview is that and, God and, is going to come back and smash these people I don't yeah. like. And, and, of course, you know, this is part of what the Jews were hoping for in a Messiah when Jesus came. They wanted a political conqueror who was going to come and free Israel. You remember there was that wonderful story in Matthew 20 where the mother of James and John comes to Jesus with a little request. Uh, Jesus, when you come into you glor your glory, you know, when you're on the throne where you're going to judge, would you allow these two sons of mine, James and John, one to sit on the left and one to sit on the right? I mean, Jesus, it has a little ring about it. Jesus, James, and John. Wouldn't it be wonderful? Uh, the, the writer or the redactor of Matthew 20 has this interesting parenthetical insert, and I wish he would have taken about two chapters to explicate it more fully. When the other disciples heard about this, they were indignant. <laughs> Your mother did what? Yeah. <laughs> you want to sit where? And you remember what Jesus does? He calls the disciples into a little circle because they have fundamentally misunderstood the character of who he is as Lord and the fundamental character of the kingdom and how it operates. And he calls him in a little circle and he says, you know how it is with the Gentile rulers. You know, look at human experience. What does it mean to be Lord? You have power and authority and you exercise it over others. Not unlike the way many Christians expect Jesus is going to return. You remember what Jesus says in the text, it will not be so with you. Why? And then Jesus shows us the way in which we think about the Lordship of Christ or any other attribute for God or any other aspect of who God is. And he doesn't say that we begin with human experience and posit its perfection. He doesn't say, well, you know, I'm a little bit like human lords and I'm a little bit not. And this is how you adjudicate between those conflicting attributes. He says, and that's not how he does it. He says, 
You know how it is with the Gentile rulers. They lorded over one another. It will not be so with you. Why? Because the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And so Jesus takes the, the concept of lordship and he turns it 180 degrees on its head, defines it in a radically countercultural way in terms of suffering servanthood that he demonstrates throughout his ministry. Remember in the upper room, the disciples still don't get it. Jesus puts the towel around his waist. He washes the disciples' feet. When he gets to Peter, Peter doesn't want him to do it. Peter still doesn't understand that lordship is not lording it over one another in power. Lordship means suffering love. And when we actually look at the relationship between the persons of the Trinity revealed in the gospel, because we don't have any access to the relationship between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, except what we see in the life of Jesus, that's where we see the, the relations between the persons of the Trinity actually lived out and embodied um, in, uh, in, in Jesus' life, we don't see any kind of hierarchical relations. Remember what it says in John's gospel? The, that uh, the, the son only does his will, only done, does the will of his father. Now, do you have any sons, Mike? You know, I've got three sons. Do they do, do your sons do your will? <laughs> my sons don't always do, do my will. Uh, but remember what else it says. John's gospel says, the father entrusts all judgment to the son, mm -hmm. that all may honor the son just as they honor the father. Now, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't entrust all judgment to my sons. <laughs> Indeed, even though they're adults, I have a clause in my will. If something happens to me, they don't even get all of their inheritance at one time because I don't even trust them with that. And remember what Jesus says about the Spirit. When the Spirit comes, he'll not bear witness to himself, but he'll bear witness to me. What we actually see between the relations between the persons of the Trinity lived out in the life of Jesus is a kind of humility, of mutual self-deference to the other and love that's very unlike the hierarchical relations that we see between human beings. So when you actually look at the attributes of God revealed in the gospel, revealed in Christ's life, death, and resurrection, they turn out to be very different, very different than what we would think of if we start with our human experience and posit its perfection and attribute it to God. Well, isn't it ironic then that the church can, can look at, the, at, at, at those passages and can say, well, you see how the, uh, Israel was expecting a different kind of Messiah, and mm -hmm. so they didn't recognize Jesus when he came mm -hmm. as Messiah, yeah. so they, they rejected him. And yet, here today, right now, this year, Mm -hmm. And the church, it, at least the church in America, mm -hmm. uh, has an idea of what Messiah should be, somebody who's going to come back and bash all the enemies yeah. and set up the church in, in its glory and do, in other words, the view of the church mm -hmm. is exactly what we say was wrong yeah. with the view that, that uh, the Israelites had when he came the first time. Yeah. It's so different than what we see in Jesus, you know. He, he comes into Jerusalem, you know, and he weeps over the city, weeps over the city. You know, I, it's interesting that when Jesus talks about the final judgment, you know, there are all kinds of surprises. Maybe one of the surprises is the kind of Jesus who's coming back to do the judging. It's going to be the lamb looking as if it were slain on the throne, you know, not uh, this triumphant conquering uh, Lord and King, who's coming back, you know, to you know, to to what to wipe people out. The triumph being the cross itself. Uh huh. The triumph being the cross itself. You know, the interesting thing about this is that uh, when you actually look at what the New Testament says about judgment, you know, it has a whole lot more to say about what the judgment of Christians, uh, the, as much to say at least about the judgment of Christians as it does to, uh, about the judgment of those who are not. You can't simply relate, uh, leave hell, and not relate it to the love of God. You have to relate heaven also to the judgment of God. And it says that there will be many books open. Uh, and it says that some Christians will pass through the final judgment clothed in white raiment, and others will come through uh, barely at all. And, and people tend to view this, you know, that this is some kind of reward uh, for good works, when I really don't think that's the intent of those texts. What's the joy for those that receive the crown of martyrdom or the crown of glory? To lay it down at Christ's feet in praise of Him. Uh, but uh, that, uh, that there will be, that the final ju uh, judgment will entail, you know, a revealing of all things, not only in non-Christians uh, and in Christians, is very clear in Scripture. If, if Christians are afraid of that, though, I think it's because they misunderstand who's going to do the judging. It's our Lord and Savior who identified uh, with us fully in our brokenness of sin. The great high priest that says in Hebrews 2 and 4, 
who is able to empathize with our weaknesses, he's going to be the one that's going to judge us. And therefore, it will always be judgment and righteousness and holiness that's tempered in love. A lot of this uh, boils down to the way people interpret the Bible. Yes. And they get the same people, uh, like the bumper sticker, God said it, I believe it, that yes. settles it. The, the same people who, who believe that will mm -hmm. still argue over how to interpret those passages yes. they think are settled. And it lies at the heart of a lot of this. Yes. So when we get together, let's talk about that next time we get together. Uh, yeah, we should talk about Scripture and our uh, assumptions around it and how we interpret it. Very, very pivotal, and it is behind all of this. You know, one final thing I'd like to say about this whole sub subject of the attributes of God, because I'm, uh, I'm a United Methodist in the United Methodist Church, and we don't like to talk about the wrath of God. We like to talk about God as a nice God, and we're nice people. You know, the wrath of God and the holiness of God is very, very important theologically and pastorally. Um, in one of the churches that I serve, you know, if you've been a pastor for a number of years and you have been faithful and the people know that you love them and they trust you, there are many of them that have dark secrets that they want to tell somebody and they finally have gotten to the point where they trust you and can tell you, but they don't do it until they know you're going to go. And so the last <laughs> few months before you leave, oftentimes if you've been a faithful pastor, people come out of the woodwork to talk to you about problems in their life. And, and a woman came to talk to me that has um, profoundly uh, influenced uh, how I think about these things. And she turned out to be, a, Mike, a better theologian than I was at that uh, point in my uh, mid-20s when I was first a pastor. And it was a, a story of, of tragic uh, abuse. And when she came to my office, she couldn't even tell me. She had to write it down on paper. And it's one of those things that we hear all too often today about a woman um, who, as, uh, as, a, as a teenager, was sexually abused by her father. And after talking to her, I knew that I was way over my head and I wanted to refer her to a friend of mine who was a uh, licensed um, uh, you know, uh, psychologist, psychiatrist, and a Christian. But she had gone to a, uh, a counselor earlier and had had a bad experience, and so she wouldn't go to him. And I said, well, I don't opposed to you know counseling but I'll listen to you tell her story and so over several weeks she told me you know her story about the abuse that she endured I never really understood human powerlessness until she told me her story it started when she was about 14 or 15 and, and lasted until she was around 20 and, and tragically her husband or excuse me her um, father uh, twisted her emotionally so that she felt like the other uh, woman. And so when her father and mother went through a divorce, she felt responsible for it. I remember one day she said, you know, Pastor L, there's never been a day in my life when I didn't remember what he did to me and how I felt about it and how dirty and guilty I feel. And, and there was a large family and every Memorial weekend, the brothers and sisters would send her money and she would have to buy flowers and put them on her father's grave. And she told me about the torment that she went through um, doing that. You know what finally brought her healing? It wouldn't have been what I ever would have thought um, from everything I knew pastorally and theologically. It was the fatherhood of God and the doctrine of hell. It was the fatherhood of God because finally it was the fatherhood of God that, and she was, here's where she was a better theologian than I was. It was the fatherhood of God that gave her a criterion by which to judge her father. So instead of starting with a human father and project it onto God, which is what I thought she would do and that she would never even want to talk about God as father. No, she wanted to talk about God as father because it was the fatherhood of God revealed in the New Testament that gave her the criterion by which she could judge her father as decadent. And it was the doctrine of hell, not because in the end she longed that her father would go there, but the doctrine of hell for her was the final testimony that we live in a moral universe. And that God says an ultimate no, not in my world will you ever do this. In other words, the cross or the, the hell points back to the cross, that God really does take seriously the sin and the brokenness and the evil of this world and deals with it objectively. And so when we let go of the justice and holiness of God, those that have perpetrated heinous evil or have had heinous evil perpetrated to them simply cannot relate to a nice God because the nice God is not able, able to, to face the ugliness of the brokenness and the evil that's done in this world and overcome it.
And so she finally was able to, um, to uh, let go of, of, of her guilt and remorse. She finally did discover that she was angry with her father and she was able to let um, go of that because uh, of the fatherhood of God and because of the holiness and justice of God, of which hell is a testimony pointing back to the cross. So I think that we're wrong to get rid of the wrath of God. I think we're equally wrong to separate it from the love of God and to have God hate um, some and love others. The holiness and love of God are finally, essentially, two sides of the same coin. Uh, a love of God that loves us and wants us to flourish and therefore has to say an absolute no to all those things that dehumanize, degrade us, all the things that we do and have done to us um, that are contrary to the, the love of God revealed in Jesus Christ on the cross. You've been watching You're Included, a production of Grace Communion International.